Hi, I'm Brent Stafford, and this is RegWatch by RegulatorWatch.com. For tobacco harm reduction to be successful, there are two factors that must be maximized, access and choice. All of the contentious issues around vaping boil down to these two factors. Choice means a wide variety of devices, satisfying nicotine levels, and of course, a plethora of flavors. While access means not banned, available for legal purchase, easily accessible via retail or online, and cost-effective for the average consumer. The rub is that when these factors are maximized in favor of converting large numbers of adult smokers to vaping, Tobacco Control says the industry is targeting kids. How do we overcome this apparent conflict? Joining us today for part two in our conversation is Dr. Cheryl Olson, a health and behavior research researcher who holds a Doctor of Science degree in health and social behavior from the Harvard School of Public Health. Dr. Olson served as a faculty member of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School for 15 years and as an assistant clinical professor of psychiatry at Massachusetts General Hospital. She also has extensive experience with smoking cessation and tobacco harm reduction. Dr. Olson, thanks again for coming on the show. My pleasure. It's our pleasure too. So as mentioned, this is part two of our interview with Dr. Cheryl Olson, produced in partnership with GFN.TV. To find part one, head to the GFN.TV channel on YouTube and look for GFN interviews playlist. Okay, Dr. Olson, I don't wanna to miss two important notes about who you are and what you do. First, you're a public health columnist at Tobacco Reporter, and I've been reading your columns since 2021, and they are excellent. And oh, you're, thanks. you bet. And you are a behavior science advisor at McKinney Regulatory Science Advisors. So this episode is all about U.S. trying to unpick, unravel the U.S. So tell us about McKinney and what you do there. At McKinney Regulatory Science Advisors, I'm part of a team of, of as it, the name implies, sort of freelance advisors who come together and and work on larger projects that we can't handle by ourselves or that might go beyond our particular specialties. So I, I do projects on my own, but I, I'm able through McKinney to take on really interesting projects. For example, I'm doing one now on a, a, um, a qualitative study of older smokers who have switched to a vaping product that they find acceptable. And these are people in their 60s and 70s, a product, uh, a group that really is in need of solutions. And uh, a lot of what I've done with McKinney is work on uh, studies for pre-market tobacco uh, market authorization for FDA um, submissions. And one of the things that I like to do, many of the many of the companies we've worked with are companies that are sort of mid-sized that have no legacy tobacco involvement at all. You know, they never sold cigarettes, and they're trying to switch smokers onto pouches or lozenges or vapes or something like that. And some, in some cases, these are companies started by people who were smokers themselves and found something that they liked better or wanted an alternative. So it's 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 very gratifying to find a way to keep these mid-sized businesses in business, to keep them in the regulatory game, because unfortunately, the way the policies are in the U.S., it's very expensive to get things through the regulatory process. And ironically, when this was meant to you know, you know, and at some level, I think to punish the, the legacy tobacco companies, right or wrong, I think it ended up helping them and giving them the leg up because they've been the only ones who could afford to play this game in some cases. So I'm trying to um, find ways to do studies for companies that will let them bridge, as they say, to the, the data that these big companies collect and keep and keep the the mid-sized folks on the market with their innovative products. Now, are they actually staying on the market? By our count, <laughs> there's been very little that has been uh, allowed to stay on market? Well, the, while they're still in the process, they can stay on the market. But it is, I mean, things are uh, often in this sort of limbo with the regulators for years, as we've seen. And it'll be interesting to see how it comes out across the course of this next year. Uh, I mean, the FDA has taken a lot of um, hits from, you know, well, they get hit from both sides. You know, the politicians who think they're not protecting kids enough and, and then people who are looking at the data on smokers and saying, why aren't you making these, these less risky products available to smokers and publicizing to smokers that these products are less risky as we see the public opinion move more and more in the direction of misinformation and mistakenly thinking that vaping is as harmful as smoking or even more so. And, you know, I certainly would like to see that too. But then um, 
they, I, I feel I really feel for the regulators, the people employed there, because they're really getting it from all sides and they're trying to look at the science. And I think they're trying to do a good job. And I'm hoping that as things settle and as the moral panic uh, about youth vaping starts to recede a bit, as they always do, uh, I think we'll start to see people be able to follow the science and the data more. And I think we'll see more sensible regulation. And I think I think, I think think it'll all sort itself out. At least I hope it will. Maybe I'm being a Pollyanna. Maybe I'm being too optimistic. Before we dive deeper into this issue, Dr. Olson, please share with our audience a bit about your background and what brought you to working on smoking cessation and tobacco harm reduction. Sure. Uh, uh, as you mentioned, I have a, a doctorate in public health. Health and behavior is my area. And I've if you look me up online, a lot of my stuff is about video game violence. I did a, um, a lot of research on the effect of violent video, video game content on teenagers. I see a lot of parallels between the video game violence research I did and tobacco and tobacco harm reduction today. Just with video game violence, there was this what you might call a moral panic over, oh my gosh, video games are turning our kids violent and aggressive. They're causing school shootings. That doesn't seem to be the case, by the way. But I saw with youth vaping, hey, you know, certainly we don't want young people to be using these products, but also if you look at the data, it's the adults who need these sorts of products. I think there's something about America in particular that seems to lend itself to panics over, if you look historically, I mean, one of the things, uh, my husband and I wrote a book about our video game research called Grand Theft Childhood, and we covered the research on things like moral panics in the 1920s over gangster films and how they thought that showing how to do crimes in a movie would literally teach young people and all those ignorant masses of immigrants how to commit crimes. And that's what led to some of the first uh, co, you know, you know, what became movie ratings today. And then in the fifties comic books, they thought that um, Batman and Robin were a gay couple and that uh, juvenile delinquents would be created by all these crime and horror comic books. Yeah, uh, and, and we see this sort of thing happening over and over, panics over, in this case, I'm talking about media, but it can also be, there was a panic over a chemical called ALR and apples. Um, there was panics over so many things. And I do think that um, we often look for easy answers and our politicians, frankly, are looking for something easy they can point to to say, aha, I'll protect your children from this menace. And I think vaping to some extent came came under that as well. And people weren't looking closely at what is the actual danger? I mean, I'm much more worried about, just briefly, about youth drinking because that can kill kill a kid today. It used to be that these moral panics were driven in some form or another from a more kind of Christian position. At least that seemed to be the case in the 1990s. And then uh, it was the right, the Republicans that were driving it, you know, in Congress. But yet this moral panic over vaping doesn't seem to be coming from that direction at all. In fact, it's coming from arguably the progressive left, not religious based, not, you know, right Republican based. How do you account for the difference? They both seem very similar though. Well, I, I do think in, in, in the US, a lot of it comes down to this sort of Puritan heritage of trying to perfect the society. And that goes, it cuts across uh, political divisions. But yeah, it was interesting with video game violence. We saw people like uh, Hillary Clinton, you know, coming out against video games. And there were politicians on, I think, I mean, the the I had a million and a half dollar grant when I was on the faculty at Harvard to study video game violence. And that came through a Republican congressman who was concerned, sincerely concerned that Grand Theft Auto games would, you know, would really undermine the moral fabric of our society. And but uh, we saw a number, if you look at the, the book, there were a number of Democratic politicians who took advantage. Rob Blagojevich, who was governor of Illinois, uh, used it cynically to pass a state law. And then he later went to jail for trying to sell what was uh, then Senator Obama's uh, Senate seat when he became president. And there was a, there's a state politician, too, who we talked about um, in California, who was a child psychologist by training, who was railing against it in California. And he ended up going to jail for actually consorting with real gangsters with names like Shrimp Boy Chow. I mean, it was like, like uh, just like a Grand Theft Auto game. It, it's fascinating how... 
how people have latched onto this in a simplistic way to stir up parents and upset people rather than looking at what are actually the real root causes of violence, which is a whole nother program, a whole nother discussion. Now, let me ask you one more question, you know, related to this was that um, you used it in some of your writings that I reviewed before the interview was that there's something about the way that scientists, uh, you know, there's a confirmation of their own beliefs that, th that this wasn't a good example of. Could you explain that? Yeah, I mean, people do tend to have a confirmation bias. You know, they, they, they look for things that, that will reinforce what they already know and believe. And it can be very upsetting for researchers to step back and say, hey, I'm wrong. These things I've been publishing for a decade or more, it's now that I see new data or look at it from a new angle, I see that I really was going in the wrong direction. I only had a little piece of the picture and I need to see it from a different different angle. I were, in, in some ways, I felt that, I think I spent about 10 years studying video game violence. And I felt that at that point I should get out of it because people, when you're in a controversial area, they sort of peg you and say, okay, you're on this side and you're on that side. And I don't know if you can be heard as well. I'm trying to not have that happen now with tobacco harm reduction because I really want to stay in this field for a while because I think lives are at stake. But I know I felt very good when for, I lived in Boston at the time. And when it, when one TV station uh, who, that interviewed me when my book came out said I was anti-game, another TV station pegged me as pro-game. I thought, okay, I'm doing the good job. I'm, I'm really going down the middle. Dr. Olson, what about the regulators? Are they evaluating the science on vaping impartially? I've talked to people even, you know, quite recently who were recently reviewing applications for the FDA. I talked to them off the record and they're telling me, we, you know, one just told me recently, I didn't personally feel the political pressure. I was just trying to follow the science and look at the science and do what made sense to me. So I think it varied. I would suspect the people at the top were the ones who were really getting the, the most of the flack. But yeah, there there were report. There was this Reagan Udall Foundation for the FDA re re review that was done recently and pub and the results published. And if you haven't seen that, please take a look at it. And they were they reported hearing from many people who worked at the FDA who said they had felt pressure and had had to you know almost alter results. So, uh, and I you know I think my sense is the FDA got a much larger volume of applications than they expected, and they were kind of drowning in it. And then receiving the pressure at the same time politically, and so they were they were casting about for a way to manage. So it was just a very difficult situation that they found themselves in. Yeah, we covered obviously the Reagan Udall report to a great extent uh, at the end of last year, and I mean there it was pretty much it was pretty strong. It it was basically saying that the FDA uh, does not have control of the process, and that process is you know subject to some bias and then of course we saw what happened with center for tobacco products and the issue around the memos uh from dr brian king so clearly there seems to be something that's going on in terms of preferring the political side as opposed to the science side and then previous to that there was the issue around the switcheroo which comes right down to I, the sticking point i think with the whole pmta process which is the appropriate for the protection of public health. And a court in a major case had said that the FDA changed what they consider to be appropriate for the protection of public health during the process without informing the companies and in a manner which makes it very difficult for anything to be approved. It was very difficult. I mean, we were looking at the guidance that was saying you don't need to do you know, uh, longitudinal studies or randomized controlled trials specifically saying that. And then suddenly the FDA was switching and saying, you need to have that kind of information, you know, things that just didn't make sense. There was a point uh, a couple of years ago, I almost two years ago, where I had I, I, maybe five different vaping company studies lined up. You know, I was just going to be, be swamped with work for months. And then everything halted because the FDA started changing their behavior and these mid-sized companies making vaping products did not feel that they could expend the money when they when when they saw that the FDA was not going to follow their own guidance from you know from their perspective, and they just everything just ground to a halt. And I, I think it was so unfortunate. Uh, and then also the way things have been interpreted. I, I worked briefly in the pharmaceutical industry at the turn of the century in Switzerland, and to, to me the, the the tobacco industry is moving toward becoming more like 
pharmaceuticals where you need to show a lot of sunlight, you need to disclose conflicts and so on. But really, you know, it's a for-profit industry that is, you know, to some extent ethically neutral. I mean, they're they're making some things, you know, with tobacco, they're making some things that kill people still. They're making other the, the newer products that they're making, the reduced risk products, that's all that's now we're creeping closer into pharmaceutical territory. And we want to, I think, encourage them to transition as quickly as possible to those products uh, and get those out to the people who are using nicotine and not quitting. You know, the, the quit rates on nicotine for the, the low income, the, the population in the US on Medicaid, you know, uh, very, you know, which is the, the health health insurance for low income folks, that's just stagnant. It's been about 28% for some years now. And we need to get products to folks like that that are just not going to quit that are possibly self-medicating with nicotine for for uh, mental health issues for trauma for you know various kinds of things but you know one, one of the things I, I noticed there was a real uh, kerfuffle when uh, several people who worked at the center for tobacco products took jobs in industry over the last year or two and i i thought wait a minute, that's been happening with pharmaceuticals for years where people would work with the FDA on the drug, you know, on the drug regulatory side, and then they go work for industry it was seen as a revolving door. And you might, you know, you might not like that. But on the other hand, it maybe it might make mean that industry can do better applications because they know then what FDA wants. But it really, but when it happened in the tobacco area, people were shocked and appalled as opposed to saying, oh, it's just like the drug industry, you know, the pharmaceutical industry here. It's it's uh, business as usual. Do you think the regulators in the U.S. have it out for the mainstream, uh, which is mid-sized companies, vaping industry? Um, do they have it out for that kind of level? And are they preferring the actual big tobacco products? I, I think that the regulators are just, my impression is that most of the people who are reviewing these products, often they're coming from other parts of the FDA. Often they're, um, one person I talked to recently said that that they'd gotten in, in, involved because they had family members who had smoked and they felt this was an, an important area to work on. But I don't think that the, the nuts and bolts rank and file people have a horse in the race, as another person put to me. They're not, they're just trying to review science and do a good job. I think Paradoxically, in some ways, the senior people might prefer to work with the legacy multinational tobacco companies because you might see them as the grownups. I mean, when when Altria bought Juul originally, now they've disinvested, but it was kind of viewed as the grownups coming in and and uh, taking over the ones who had all the experience dealing with the legal problems and dealing dealing with an addictive product that really needs needs a lot of oversight. Uh, I think, you know, unfortunately, some of the, some of these companies were treating um, reduced harm vaping products and marketing them like they would a new, you know, new iPod or something like that, a new tech product. And you can't do that with an addictive product. I wrote a piece for Tobacco Reporter uh, about this, you know, for people who are new to the to the nicotine industry, things you have to know because as soon as you are working with an addictive nicotine product, the whole legacy of bad behavior of the industry over decades is kind of basically now clamped to your leg. Yeah, and, and, and when the regulators meet you, they're seeing big tobacco. And if you go to a conference, you're now with big tobacco. Even if you're working with some startup that has never sold cigarettes, you've got to be aware of the history of really awful behavior by industry and know that people are watching for that to happen again. In the lead to this episode, in part two here of our conversation, you know, I was trying to draw you know, uh, uh, the contrast between what is access and choice, which is critical for vaping, and then, but doesn't that attract teens? Because of course, lots of flavors, problem with teens. Lots of availability of the devices where they're sold, problem for teens. How do we get over this conflict? Basically it comes down to what's appropriate for the protection of public health. And if you're gonna favor on adult smokers, you're gonna maximize access and choice. If you favor, uh, you know, decreasing the availability for youth, you're going to minimize that. How do we get over this conflict? I think part of the answer is going to be just waiting for this moral panic over youth vaping to die down, which I think it's crested and is starting to die down a little bit so people can maybe look at the, the evidence a little bit better. And we're also, as more evidence comes in, I mean, people, this is an issue that people should be concerned about. We have to protect youth. We don't, we know historically 
in most countries, most smokers start when they're teenagers. So of course people are looking to protect them. But as we're seeing over time, the availability of vaping to the public, including to youth, coincided with a an acceleration in the decline of smoking rates to where they're just eye-poppingly low at this point. And, and that doesn't get celebrated the way it should. You smoking, I think it's now something like 1.9% among high school seniors in the in the last 30 days, I believe. I have to double check that. But it's it's just amazingly low. And we should be celebrating that. And the th the flavor issue is frustrating because when you look at comments that were made maybe five years ago about youth attracting flavors, they would talk about ones from some of these little companies that were being really bad actors, you know, cotton candy flavor or unicorn poop or something crazy like that. And they would talk about, you know, a candy flavor. Yes, that looks like something that is aimed at youth, even though often adults do use them. But then they started to move the goalposts. And then they would say anything that's a flavor, fruit flavors. Well, I mean, a lot of things are fruit flavored. Why would they, you know, you can get, you know, mango flavor, in a lot, you know, in gum, in white claw, you know, hard seltzer, you can get it in a lot of different things. Why are we singling out vaping here? And then, and then, and then, and then they move to okay, menthol. Well, that's a that's a cigarette flavor. I mean, that's don't you want something that the cigarette smokers who like menthol can transition to? I mean, it's really, and 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 when you look at the data of is it flavors that cause youth to to start vaping. It we look at when the surveys add response options, the earlier surveys didn't have options such as I was curious. When they added that later, I, curiosity was up there with, with the flavor sounded good and wanting to make big vape clouds, other things. Other, when they make those options available in the surveys as responses, then you see that youth are saying other, re there's many other reasons that they're trying vaping. And really curiosity is the main one. So I think flavors have become a, a real red herring. And I'm, and you certainly see in the data on, uh, for adults, smokers, that, and, and anecdotally, you hear also that many people go to, they might might start with a tobacco or menthol flavor. They go to some other kind of flavor oftentimes. And then when they smoke a cigarette, they you know, when they run out of a vape or they're a friends, the cigarette can be quite aversive to them because they're not used to that taste anymore. And as I mentioned, I mentioned with my research on incarcerated people that people who were smoking post-incarceration, a flavored product, a non-tobacco flavor, their intentions over the coming months were to vape more and smoke less. And only the people who smoked a tobacco flavor were saying, I'm gonna probably smoke more. That was a very small sample, but there's, I guess a lot, it's in line with a lot of other data we're seeing out there. If you could pull out your crystal ball and provide a prediction for vaping over the next five years in the US, what would that be? I think that there'll be a lot of bumps in the road, but I think that gradually we'll see vaping come to be more accepted. I think what might help too is raising awareness among health professionals and politicians, other influential people about not just vaping, but about nicotine pouches and lozenges and all this wide range of other reduced risk products that are out there that I wouldn't know about if I weren't doing research in this area. And we need to help people understand what, what's out there. I would love to do show and tell boxes for physicians and nurses, take them around to universities and where they're being trained and to, you know, um, to hospitals and say, look, here's, here's what this stuff is. Here's all these products that your patients might be using, seeing in convenience stores, seeing in vape shops that you don't know about. And here's what we know so far about them. They are not safe. They are definitely a lower risk from a toxicological perspective. And while we won't know everything for decades, obviously, we can tell just from the toxicology that these are much less risky. And if you have patients who have failed transitioning to other products, these are things you need to take a look at and think about.